So we're in the last talk, moving to Christiane. Christiane will talk about translational challenges. I think she's a real innovator in the field, very persistent, 10, 15 years of continuously pushing this complex but really good technology forward in many regards. I'm not sure how much science she will be discussing, but I'm sure it will be an inspiring lecture and a good basis for the discussion. Please. Thank you, Tuan, for already a very nice, uh, let's say, introduction, but also the other speakers uh, giving insights into, indeed, the science of polymeric micelles. And indeed, my talk will be, let's say, more high over, meaning I will touch upon the science, but particularly tell about the 15-year story of crystal therapeutics and then particularly about the, the polymeric micelles that we developed. So maybe a little bit of background, because I would kind of sketch the, the background also of myself. Um, I, as a pharmacist by training, I did my PhD already, as mentioned, under supervision of Wim Henning. Uh, and then I thought at the end of my PhD, well, the data that we generated back then were kind of really discriminating what was known in 2007, meaning we did have some very nice uh, circulation time as well as some good uptake in tumor models. So why don't I move forward and aim at least to, to bring it to the, to the clinic? So that was the initial aims, and then with some grants as well, some uh, awards, I was able to actually establish the company uh, with actually also help of Dan Komelin, uh, because he introduced me to the co-founder, Joost Holthuis, and I established the company in 2011, Crystal Delivery BV, as it's formally called. 2007, a uh, historical perspective had already been mentioned by Tuan, but uh, this is just the... Uh, the PubMed of polymeric micelles as of today, uh, but you see uh, 2010, there was kind of the, the rising, uh, uh, on the rise in, in general, um, and also in 2007, there was a nice review paper by Bob Langer as well as Omid Verhoekstad, uh, describing that it's really an emergent platform. So that was, let's say, the, the nice way, that the hype that uh, was ongoing, and particularly also the, the two guys I just mentioned, they started companies like Bind as well as did others, and they're really aiming that the, the nanomedicine revolution uh, initiated. So I was really in a good, let's say, environment, and I also wanted to move forward. So I was really excited, and as you go in general, um, this is uh, in general for all kinds of sectors, if you're uh, ambitious to go start up in a, in a startup company or you establish the company yourself, Clearly, there is a lot of enthusiasm in the beginning, and then the real work has to get done. <laughs> um, and then you also uh, are encountered with some setbacks, and then you have to kind of find the endurance in yourself and to move forward, hopefully to find this, let's say, the pivotal trigger point, and then finding uh, the incline, uh, the, the increase again. But then also we should be realistic over time. Uh, and again, this is uh, not specific for life science, but this is in general uh, quite a number of reasons why uh, startup companies uh, have to shut down. So failing is a word I purposely do not use, but while companies have to shut down. I would say in life science, bullet number one is not really applicable. And why is that? In life science, we're always trying to improve the treatment, improve the diagnosis. So I would say there is always a medical need in the, in the life science space. But a lot of the other reasons may be applicable. For example, uh, are, is the competitors, are they, they doing better? Um, is your product not performing as you hoped for? Who is in your team? Is there sufficient expertise on board? So a lot of different reasons, but uh, I didn't know all those reasons back then. I simply want to go forward and, let's say, go for making the dream come reality. Um, and the dream was that the Crypec nanomedicine platform, as already has been presented by Wim and by Tuan, um, had, let's say, these four uh, claims to be achieved. So particles long circulating in the bloodstream, nicely entrapping the drug, so no premature release, really having a selective accumulation at the tumor site and then only locally there having controlled release of the drug over time, really only hitting the tumor and having less exposure and hence uh, no adverse events to the, um, the healthy tissue. Um, that was the platform. But clearly, and I will touch upon, let's say, the more business elements of that, uh, a platform development is not that beneficial. Back in the days, so we really said, we really have to develop a product, because a product is what is really showing the added value of the underlying platform. So if you talk about product development in, um, in general, then this picture is not uh, on purpose not to be read in detail, but it's, it's really showing all the different elements of, uh, that you have to tackle along new product development. Um, we've heard about the guidelines also yesterday, but for me, in short, it comes down to three elements, namely that you need to demonstrate the production robustness, you need to demonstrate the safety as well as the efficacy, um, and clearly in increasing steps and with increasing criteria. So 
I think the figure itself shows that it's quite a complex story. So the key lesson for me was already as of the early days to hire experts to prevent, let's say, the obvious failures uh, over time. And then to start off talking with the manufacturability, this was the product that I literally made in Utrecht um, at the lab of Wim Hennig. So small amounts, uh, high concentration, by the way, as we mentioned, uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, but then we immediately went to the, to the true experts, and I'm pleased to see that uh, Sylvie Mewes from Adena is in the room today, because the, she was literally herself very helpful in the overall translation of the bench to, let's say, large-scale production of the Crypec nanomedicine. So all in all, production from one milliliter to 40 liter, um, uh, fortunately all uh, complying to, as was discussed yesterday, the critical quality contributes. And maybe I, I dive into one topic, which is that we did define docetaxel, which we define as the, the drug uh, substance. So that's the active ingredient. Uh, and we did define the uh, drug product as the entire nanoparticle. And why is that interesting? Because in our situation, we do have a covenant linkage of the drug linker to the polymeric system. So we, there was a lot of debate. Um, I'm happy to talk about it later on. But so drug substance is those taxel. We conjugate the linker to that. Um, and then in the next step, we conjugate it to the polymers in, in a way um, that is too scientific for this conversation. But it's a, a polymeric nice, micellar structure, which is covalently cross-linked, meaning to ensuring that the drug is initially stably entrapped. Uh, ensuring also long circulation over time. Um, so fully upscaled um, and also in view of cost, what we've actually done some calculations that if you produce these systems on a large scale, then the main cost contributor is actually docetaxel itself. So it's not the entire process because it's really straightforward, only two steps, easily upscalable. So only the drug itself is the main cost contributor. So that was uh, already a very good step. And then thanks to Tuan um, for already uh, illustrating all kind of uh, in vitro data, sorry, in vivo data. Now I'm going to go fast forward to, I would say, one of the most exciting phase one studies that we've done. Clearly, we've done, let's say, the standard dose escalation setup. But this study showed uh, in a, I would say, fairly unique way, the head-to-head -head comparison of uh, our systems, our nanomedicine, as compared to the standard uh, conventional taxodere. The study was done together with Ron Matthijs at the Erasmus University, and the unique setup means that we had actually a crossover design study, meaning each patient was its own control. So either they get first the our product and then the conventional mm -hmm. dose cell, CD stands for a conventional, or the other way around. So um, over time, both blood samples as well as tumor tissues are sampled, and that allowed us to really monitor in patient uh, the actual overall biodistribution instead of having to compare to literature data. So then this is the most, um, let's say, interesting outcome of this uh, so-called Crytek study. Uh, on the left side, uh, we really could demonstrate a very long, prolonged circulation of the, the micelles. Um, so uh, this is m measured up to 24 hours. Why is that? Because then the taxotere was already almost fully removed from the bloodstream. Um, not only from a PK profile did we show a superior profile, but also from the adverse event profile. Those taxel is known to have a really strong effect on the, uh, on the bone marrow, and we could see a significant drop in the life-threatening neutropenia grade 3 to 4 from, um, let's say, 75% to less than 5%. So really, the, let's say, the claim to fame is no, or at least substantially less exposure was ob uh, obviously seen in this phase 1 tr study. And then last but not least, uh, following up on what has been discussed earlier, we were actually able to very nicely illustrate a much higher accumulation of our product in as compared to Taxotere. Uh, on average, a fourfold higher increase, and uh, the details are in, in the publication. Um, but what was nicely demonstrated that the nanoparticles really had a really prolonged uptake. What was also really, let's say, striking for me and also completely unexpected is that taxotere itself resided up to 14 days in the tumor tissue. So to the best of my knowledge, those experiments have not, never done before, meaning measuring actual patients, the drug levels in the tumor site over time. Um, and we, where we always claim the drug is rapidly eliminated, we see that on the left side, the plasma PK is rapidly dropping but we hardly ever measured in patient setting the drug levels. That's what the claim to fame is. We should have more drugs to the tumor. In our situation, we only by, by, by then measure that the drug levels were actually quite high over time. Nevertheless, we went forward. We had an increased uptake of the nanoparticles, improved safety profile. So all cards on green to go forward to the phase two study, which we've uh, done uh, in a multicenter setup. 
uh, in ovarian cancer, clearly monitoring both the efficacy as well as also aiming to see potential efficacy signals. Um, so the safety uh, elements were kind of confirming the previous data all in all, uh, showing the really significant drop in neutropenia. Um, but then if we took a look at the efficacy data, we clearly did see some signs of efficacy. Um, we had some uh, stable diseases, but unfortunately really very moderate. Um, and we even had a, a so-called Simon II stage design, meaning we did adjust the, the inclusion criteria after the first stage. Um, and that was particularly to re reduce the number of previous lines of treatment. Um, and yesterday in the uh, contribution by Professor Egamont, he made a very clear statement, which I find very appealing, namely that in the evaluation of new medicines, we always have to start late in, in the advanced uh, setting, meaning patients are already previously heavily pretreated. That's, I think, what we have also seen here, namely we have had patients with four, five or even six line of previous treatment. So we do not really know how the tumor tissue literally looking and meaning also we do not know if the EPR effect that we saw in, in, in the previous study, if that's actually happening in these kind of uh, patients. So all in all, the data actually look more, not uh, as, uh, over prom uh, as, as hopeful as we initially looked for. So then if you take a look, overall conclusions of the almost 100 patients that we treated, clearly we had a really excellent safety profile of, of the drug versus Taxotere. Um, we had a significant improved tumor uptake. I mean, that was the initial concept that we literally could also demonstrate in the clinical setting. Um, but then in view of efficacy, it did not really outperform Taxotere. And then we are not doing this purely from an academic perspective, but the aim is to go to, uh, from, a, from a company perspective, is to aim to license this product to other potential buyers. So then we are having quite some good discussion with all kinds of different parties, and they really appreciate the concept, they appreciate the data package, uh, and so on. So the initial data are really good. Bus business case is positive, meaning they need to do some uh, investment, but they will get a return on it over time. Then we had the phase two data and we had to go back to those potential customers. And then they said, well, uh, you have some feedback from the FDA and the EMA. You need to do some additional studies because we initially wanted to go to ovarian cancer. The data didn't look that promising. So we thought we probably better go to, let's say, for example, prostate cancer, where there is known to be uh, a better uh, or a need for a better uh, tolerable product. So particularly because of the improved safety profile, that could be a better indication. Better indication means we had to repeat such a trial, so that means extra time. Uh, and then also that we need to do some additional work because we had a liquid formulation, we need to switch to a freeze-dried product, meaning doing some bridging studies. All in all, making the business case negative, meaning they, the company is still interested from the concept, but since the additional investments are required, the time to market was longer. Patent was expiring only in 10 years, so that seems really long but overall the time to regain money, uh, assuming actual approval, was too short. And that was clearly uh, some sort of a massive setback uh, for, for me and for the company in general. And then I also have to talk about a little bit more in general about a company like ours. We were next to governmental funding. We were also financed by venture capital. And to the ones of you who are not known with venture capital, uh, I think it's really uh, a very helpful and essential field to go, or tool, sorry, investment tool, um, to make these high risk developments possible. So venture capital is always looking for uh, true innovations and they are aware that it's costing a lot of money with also a high risk for failures. And that means that on the long run, they aim to go for so-called exit, meaning that they're selling their shares against a good or a, preferably a high return on investment because they know that uh, quite, of their invest quite a number of their investment will unfortunately fail over time. So if you go to them, you're kind of selling your dream in the beginning. That's what we've done. We've been fortunate to have venture capital investment as of 2012. Um, and we, we sold the dream, actually, they're focusing then on, on two elements, meaning your business plan as well as the team who's going to execute on that. So the, the plan is the really straightforward approach, uh, not going into too much detail, but particularly about the team, it's about do you have the right expertise on board? Plus, are you capable of being flexible, meaning shifting gears if you see that you're not meeting the initial goals? Um, and that's um, because of clearly they need to go for the exit or on the long run. 
So then we had, uh, let's say, a massive uh, brainstorm in-house. Uh, and I'm also pleased that, that Werner Cotrils is here because he uh, was our chairman and is currently the CEO. Um, we had a really massive uh, brainstorm thinking, okay, the product is so-so. How can we still further um, commercialize the by then three platforms that we had developed, which is the CryPack platform, the use of the same type of nanoparticles for vaccine applications, or even long before COVID, we were already working on these uh, systems, as well as that a coincident development that we had, so-called the clicker chemistry, which is conjugation chemistry. So we did have these three enabling technologies, uh, and we really look forward to close business deals on these uh, enabling technologies, clearly focusing on uh, really innovative approaches and uh, the applications and product development. We, um, we've done really a lot of uh, intense years on business development, uh, but the reality um, means that uh, after some internal uh, in-depth discussions, we had to go into a reorganization. And as of last year, October, we're only focusing on what we called the, the next generation um, superglue, meaning a clicker, which is the conjugation chemistry. Uh, and if you're interested to learn more about that, I'll give a presentation this afternoon at 20 past five in, the, in that session. Um, so that's uh, what Crystal is currently focusing on, and we unfortunately had to shelf the, the Crypic nanomedicines despite the, the promising uh, progress and the data generated so far. So what does that mean for me personally? Um, I think I've learned quite a number of lessons, and at least lessons I'd like to share with you. Um, all in all, and, and this is about the different elements, and clearly as in, in, in real life, nothing is ever white and black. Um, because what we started off with, and that's what I also hope I showed you today, the manufacturing went really smooth. Uh, cost of goods were none of an issue whatsoever. We did a very nice biologic proof of concept in different models, demonstrating both the, the PK, uh, but also the efficacy in preclinical studies. Clinical, nice safety as demonstrated. We also had the clinical proof of concept. There were some discussions uh, about the drug. But then clearly the efficacy in this one model was not sufficiently uh, to demonstrate the improved efficacy. And that's what the, the final aim is. Are patients really being treated better? Do they really see a benefit out of this, let's say, additional investment that is required to bring this new product to the patient, to, to the market? So clearly if we, we had one uh, indication tested, then let's say the business came, became ne negative, as I said earlier. And all in all, I, I do think we have had right people on board, but clearly on hindsight, you could have, uh, could have said, maybe we should have chosen a different uh, indication. Maybe we should have chosen a different drug, uh, referencing to the long-term residence of the dose cell in the tumor tissue. But that's always the easy part. On hindsight, you can say so many things. Um, so all in all, uh, the, let's say the, the collaborations, we had quite some very nice collaborations, um, but clearly also the overall market perception was not that really promising after, let's say, the, the failure of um, BIND in 2016, I think it was. Then the, the uphill battle to get investors interested in nanomedicines was, at least for us as a, as a company, quite difficult. So despite having a good patent protection, then the cash flow became negative, and that's why the, uh, the company had to undergo this restructuring. Um, as I just mentioned. So that's more or less the, the general, um, let's say, biotech experience for me personally. Uh, clearly, it has been quite an endeavor, uh, but also a true roller coaster, which I really appreciate. And let's say um, uh, it, uh, there was always sufficient energy um, to ride the roller coaster because it's, it's following my dream. Uh, I always wanted to bring the drug to patients and ideally to the markets. Well, that's unfortunately not feasible. Um, but also the big, let's say, that, that's the dreamer perspective, but the realistic perspective, and that's what I really want to share with all of you, is we can do all kind of brilliant science, but at the end of the day, that does not pay the salaries. So that's really, let's say, my main lessons learned. Commercialization is really key as of the early days. Who is going to pay for what by when? Um, and then clearly you can have a long-term strategy, um, but in daily practice you have to act, have operational excellence to make it really happening in daily practice. Um, so, lessons learned along the, the line, yeah, quite a bit, um, but as I said in the beginning, it does not absolutely feel like a failure. Uh, I think I've learned uh, really uh, to be resistant over time, also becoming way more creative over time, or to say it to the youngsters even more positively, maybe if you're not failing, you're not pushing boundaries, or if uh, other people even say, uh, in many of the other startup companies, people are second, third, or uh, fourth founders. Um, 
Clearly, this is my story, but I couldn't have done it uh, with a very nice uh, team. Uh, and that's also what I learned along the way. Uh, I mentioned about, let's say, the different expertises that are required. That's absolutely the case, uh, but it's also about the different personalities. And uh, I mean, not only science, but also business is really teamwork. Um, so I really have, uh, enjoyed working together. This was uh, Crystal when we were at, uh, let's say, the, 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 the biggest scale. Um, uh, and also I've learned a lot how to keep everybody together, motivated going forward, even if we've had to undergo reorganization and so on. Um, so I'm very pleased with that. And well, by now, um, I'm not going to pr actively pursue polymeric mycins myself, but I'm really pleased to see there are so many uh, initiatives ongoing. Um, on the academic field, uh, quite a number of interesting publications, and I mean, I'm, I'm still uh, monitoring them more or less. So, publications about lessons learned, but also about new production methods. But also here today, um, I saw on the posters some interesting companies moving forward, uh, even also some um, really high um, money being raised, so 260 million. And then if you take a look, they're really focusing on superior delivery. So that's really focusing on uh, nanomedicines uh, going for the delivery. Um, clearly, last week's uh, Nobel Prize had also boosted this field, uh, again, focusing on nanomedicine. Or then the big question is, will we be outsmarted over time by other uh, approaches? And I think we've also had some other nice presentations in this conference. Um, however, in general, if somebody is able and willing to jump on the, let's say, translational roller coaster, I would just say enjoy the ride uh, because it's really fun. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Many important lessons.